Hello, my name's Carol Sheriff, and today our conversations with Adam Carhane take a slightly different focus. So Adam's writing a new book that will be published in early 2021. So today I'll be questioning him about his new thinking and his new book. So Adam, you've been incredibly generous in telling us about your ideas, uh, particularly around collaboration. Um, I know you're also working on a new book and this has more its focus is on facilitation. So I think broader than collaboration. So I'm really intrigued and glad we can have like a preview of that. But so can you tell us first of all what you know how are you defining facilitation so i've been working as a facilitator uh, pretty well all day every day for 30 years and so uh, yeah i thought i would write a book about facilitation it's not different from collaboration um in fact i'm defining a facilitator as somebody who helps people collaborate but i wanted to write specifically about that role not about the general theme of collaboration or solving tough problems or collaborating with the enemy, but particularly about the role of a facilitator. And I'm defining a facilitator as, as anybody who helps people work together. And I'm saying that that role can be played um, by anybody, by a professional facilitator or not, by a manager, by a member of a group, by a friend, uh, by a chairperson. Um, in person, online, uh, in a in a two hour process or a two year process, that this is all facilitation. And um, I guess I'm going further, uh, and I'm saying that this role of facilitating, uh, I think, is becoming more and more important <laughs> because the the uh, the room we have to to deal with things simply by bossing people around, by managing them or leading them around, uh, I think is getting smaller. And so this idea that, that uh, different people or different stakeholders uh, faced with a difficult or problematic situation need to collaborate uh, to make progress, to me is a, big theme in the world and and the people who can help that happen are our facilitators so so i'm i'm trying to redefine uh what we mean by facilitators and uh to say that this has a much bigger contribution to make in the world than uh than we might think that will be music to the ears of the International Association of Facilitators and its members. And I know you, this book is still, I think you've, you're quite far with it, but it's still a work in progress. So can you introduce us to maybe one or two ideas, you know, from the book that we'll read about? Yeah. I, uh, so the book is uh, is almost finished. It's uh, the title is Facilitating Breakthrough, and it'll be out in uh, the middle of 2021 from Barrett Kohler. So there's uh, here's a few of the ideas. Uh, we've talked about some of them already, but um, the inspiration from the book came from uh, a workshop I was in three years ago in 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 Colombia, the country of Colombia, uh, just after the signing of the the, the peace accords that ended this 52 year uh, brutal civil war. And uh, I was facilitating a, a group of people who were trying to uh, create a better way forward for their region in the southwest of the country, a very diverse group with former guerrillas and politicians and business leaders and community activists and indigenous people, and academics. And uh, there was one man in the group who I'd met before. He's a very remarkable man, very well known in Colombia. His name's Francisco Duru. He had just been appointed the week before as the 
president of the Truth Commission to, to, to look at everything that happened during the war. So I was pretty surprised that he'd shown up at this, at this, uh, this workshop we were running. And I asked him why he, why he'd come. And he said, well, he was, uh, he was really trying to figure out how to get people to work together on difficult issues. And he thought he might learn something. Uh, so anyhow, the workshop went quite well. Uh, and at the end of the first day, Francisco comes running up to me and he says, Adam, I see what you're doing. I said, well, what am I doing? He says, you're removing the obstacles to the expression of the mystery. So this was a very mysterious uh, statement. And I talked to him about it for a long time and I've thought about it for a long time. And uh, this new book is all an unpacking of that one sentence. You're removing the obstacles to expression of the mystery. So uh, I really, it's fun writing a book about one sentence somebody says to you in a workshop, but sometimes you hear something that uh, that's, uh, that's worth digging into. And so the first thing I got from that is I realized that, you know, when facilitators talk about their work or talk about their frustrations or talk about what they're trying to figure out, the most common phrase they use is how do I get people to dot, dot, dot. And what I realized is when I really think about my experience, uh, most of the time uh, people want to work together <laughs> that, or they think they want to, or they think they need to work together. They just don't know how, or they're, they're not confident they can. And so when they're able to, they're, they're thrilled, they're overjoyed, they're over the moon about it. So the first thing I realized is that the basic task of the facilitator is not to get people to do anything, but to remove the obstacles that are in their way or to help them remove the obstacles that are in their way. And that image of I'm removing the obstacles, I'm, re I'm taking the boulders that are blocking the stream out of the stream and then the stream will flow uh that i don't have to you don't have to make a stream flow you don't have to not much use trying to push a stream but if you remove the obstacles then it'll flow by itself so then the question comes what are the obstacles and uh i think the obstacles all arise from choosing either the vertical pole or the horizontal pole that most people think they have to choose, and choosing is always an error. That if I choose the vertical way of facilitating, the bossy uh, directive way of facilitating, which many facilitators do, as you said, especially um, uh, when they're nervous or feel challenged or insecure, but the downside of the bossy way of facilitating uh, is that the process and the work becomes very rigid and the participants, particularly the, the marginalized or junior members become, become uh, 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 oppressed or dominated. And, that, and this is a huge obstacle. This prevents uh, contribution and connection. The other extreme, which many facilitators often do, I think I've tended towards this other extreme, is this horizontal extreme where you say, no, no, the most important thing is that everybody's voice gets heard and everybody's treated the same and nobody's forced to do anything. In other words, a, an anti-hierarchical way of facilitating. And this also presents obstacles, in particular the obstacle of, of things becoming fragmented and dispersed and nothing get, getting done. So. That's why I, the, the main point of the book is what the facilitator needs to do is not choose either the vertical approach or the horizontal approach, but to continuously move back and forth between these two. And for that, the crucial capacity is the capacity to pay attention, not get distracted, not get upset, not get overwhelmed, not get frightened. Uh, but to just stay with it. What's going on here? What's the move I need to make next? So you don't have to wait till next July. You've already got the summary, saved yourself uh, uh, 
uh, $17.95, you, you got the whole thing now. <laughs> Thank you, that's very, very generous of you. I'm going to throw one more, if I may, because I know you've written in the past about um, power and love and, um, you know, that as I guess a polarity and uh, as I understand it and from a, a previous conversation we had you're beginning to say power love and equity uh, equality I think justice I think I'm not quite sure which words you're using are you able to tell us a little bit about that and we will buy your book I promise you <laughs> uh yeah, so this is um, what I think is a more fundamental version of what I said earlier about equitable um, contribution and connection. So that's sort of the, the facilitator speak version of it. I think there's a, a more fundamental and a bigger version of exactly the same idea, which is to talk about power, love, and justice. And yes, I've written previously about the polarity between power and love, uh, that uh, um, both of these uh, are misunderstood words. Power is, in many people's mind, conflated with oppression, and love is conflated with sentimentality or romance. But I would argue, or I have argued, I wrote a book called Power and Love, that uh, that actually the, uh, the ability to, on the one hand, um, yeah, try to get something done in the world, try to grow, try to contribute, try to develop, uh, try to realize yourself and your ambition and your organization's ambition, that's power. And at the same time, uh, to try to connect and unite and make whole uh, uh, the love side. And there's a, a famous a sentence in a, a speech of Martin Luther King Jr., one of his final speeches before he was assassinated, where he said, uh, power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Yeah. Uh, this clash between immoral power and powerless morality is the, the, the challenge of our time. So, um, I think that many facilitators are aware of the danger of power without love. People just trying to get things done without any sense of connection uh, to others. And I think many people got into facilitation because of that. And yes, that's half the problem. But King is very clear that the other version, love without power is sentimental and anemic, is equally dangerous. And I would say more dangerous in a way because it's harder to see. Power without love is obvious. It's steamrolling over people or talking over them or at the extreme limit, genocide. But love without power is where we say, well, thanks very much, but could we just get back to what the group wants to do here? Could we just focus on the whole? Could you just please... Um, uh, uh, um, be quiet about what matters to you. That's love suppressing power. And, uh, and that's in a way more dangerous because it's, it's insidious. Somebody once told me when I, after I published Power and Love, I gave a talk and somebody said to me, you know, I work in the, in, in the healthcare field, in hospitals, and one of the worst things, you, uh, you can hear in such a meeting is when somebody says, could we please just focus on the patients? And usually this is a, his point was, this is a disingenuous comment. Nobody had forgotten about the patients, but people say, let's just focus on the patients as a way of, of having love smother power, of, as a way of saying, could, could the nurses please just pipe down here about their complaints? Uh, or the administrators just put that to the side, could we focus on the patient? So, <clears throat> so I'm particularly concerned 
about uh, love denying power being sentimental and anemic. Anyway, that's what I wrote about a lot, and that's what this book Power and Love is about. But what I've come to realize is that there's a third component of this, which I'm calling justice. And the way I think about that is uh, justice is about the way things are set up, the way the system works, the structure of the system or the collaboration or the meeting, which gives some people or some groups privilege in how they can exercise their power and love uh, and um, uh, other people uh, are marginalized in how they can exercise their power and love. So, so I think to overlook justice, to overlook equity is <clears throat> to prevent any progress in dealing with many, if not all, of the, the most important issues we have to deal with. So yes, <clears throat> I'm arguing that the, that the fuller story of what a facilitator needs to do <clears throat> and a fuller story of what collaboration has the potential to contribute has to address not just power, not just love, uh, but, but power, love, and justice, all three together. But that's the only way to, to, to really affect a transformation in organizations or, or healthcare systems or, or, uh, or larger societal issues. And that's, I think, the larger potential uh, that facilitation has to contribute. A facilitation is not just making an orderly meeting. It's, it's, what is required to help people work together on the things that matter to them, bringing all of the power, all of the love, and all of the justice uh, into the work. That, that, that's what I think the larger potential of facilitation is. That's a fabulous vision and mission, isn't it? I can uh, think that people listening in will be really, really interested in that. And almost it's like, um, yes, signing up to that vision of uh, facilitation. Adam, that's a lovely point to end our discussions. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for your time, but even more so um, your thinking and say, uh, explaining to us your ideas. Well, it's come to the end of our conversations. I'd like to say an especially big thank you, Adam, for all his time and for sharing his thoughts so clearly. And I don't know about you, but he certainly stimulated my thinking. At times I thought, oh, I don't know whether I can do that. And at other times I thought, yes, that's what I needed to know. I hope your experience has been the same. Remember, if you want to take part in these conversations, you can do so by commenting on the Wilson Sheriff YouTube site, or please feel free to contact Adam and I on Twitter using at Carol Sheriff and at Adam Cahay. Thank you so much for joining us.